back. It's here. I know it. What? That's a dead end. Come on. Can't you hear it? What? She's calling. I just want you to stop saying odd shit. Like you smell a psychosphere or you're in someone's faded memory of a town. Just stop. After watching one of the most baffling and underwhelming series finales of all time, it seems only fair that this strange mess of a show has to be reevaluated, given new evidence that has come to light. I say reevaluated because I had initially examined the differences between season 1 and season 4 in another video, which at the time was also a way of expressing my doubts and confusion with some of the directions Night Country was heading towards. But man, after watching that finale, I just have to go back into it and dive deeper into exactly how terrible it all really was. Spoilers ahead. I believe it's safe to say that after the first five episodes, a lot was hinging on the finale to redeem the whole season. And I really couldn't see how exactly they were going to wrap up all of the questions in just one hour, while also delivering a stellar conclusion. Thus, I expected it was going to be a rushed mess. In reality, the finale was actually quite slow, and for what it's worth, it did, quote unquote, wrap up the main mystery with an answer. It somehow did fit in some important links, but an emphasis on the word but, it was stupid. Moreover, there was still so much left unanswered and when you look back on the previous episodes, there's just so many things that I don't even know why they were brought up in the first place because they were never touched upon again in the finale. Firstly, the discovery and interrogation of Raymond Clark. For almost the entire season, we had been waiting and looking to find this guy who was basically the only suspect and the biggest clue for shedding some light onto what happened to the group of scientists who were killed. In the finale, we watch Navarro and Damas break through an ice cave which is connected to the underground facility of the Salal research station and by doing so, they eventually find Raymond Clark. Now I won't get into too much nitty gritty detail of this, but just very briefly, I believe it's simply ridiculous how they even found him in the first place. Not only of just finding the right hole to pickaxe through, but then just to walk through this ice cavern, go through a tight crevice, based off some wild supernatural hunch or calling, to then fall through the floor and land upon the entrance that leads to where Clark was studying core samples, and then discover him. I mean, what the f***? In contrast to season 1, we had a similar spooky entrance to the lair of the villain, but at least it made sense how they got there in the first place. Marty and Rust looked up records of a person who painted houses and then found the address of the children's killer. It was a legitimate address and way of finding him, not some dumbfounded luck discovery. But fine, I'll give them some benefit of the doubt. They did make their way to that location through some kind of detective work. And ultimately, luck is luck. It's good fortune. But when they finally do get to Clark and tie him down to that chair, they don't even begin to interrogate or ask him any questions. Like, what happened to the group of scientists? Did he have anything to do with the death of Annie? Was there something going on with the mine and the station? What about the microorganism they were studying? All they do is place some earphones on him to play the sounds of Annie's death on loop. Don't even get me started on why they just didn't get a speaker or play it out loud from their phone, but they had to seriously duct tape their earphones to him. And then they just walk away. Like, what the hell are you doing? Why are you dragging this investigation out even further? After having their smoker, they then return back to begin asking their first question, what happened to Annie? Which brings me to my second biggest gripe, the revelation of how she died. Now I understand the frustration one scientist or even a whole group of scientists can have after someone destroys their research, but I'm sorry. For the reaction for them to then quickly turn on Annie for ruining their studies and samples to just go straight away to murder is just bizarre. Sure, maybe one of them who had a hot temper for some reason, but one that was never established in the show because he was just some nobody in the background, and two, why did the rest of the group just follow his lead and hold her down? Like, do they even know who she is? Do they even know what just happened? And why would they even condone such actions like murder? As seasoned scientists, wouldn't they have ever seen failed experiments occur? Couldn't they just wait a few more years to collect more samples and data, given the supposed importance of their research instead of risking going to prison for murder? 
It doesn't make any f***ing sense. It's such an overreaction. But okay, fine. We got an answer now. Let's move on. From this point, Danvers walks away again and leaves Navarro alone, who practically asks Danvers if she will stop this murder of Clark, to which Danvers says, is all yours. What? Why are you not continuing this interrogation? What happened to figuring out how the group of scientists were killed? And what about the relationship to the mine? You've literally only got Clark as a witness to Annie's murder, and you're basically happy for Navarro to do whatever to him? Once again, the episode takes a pause in the pace, and we just watch more dumb scenes of filler dialogue until they go back to him and talk to him to find out that something had occurred where he had to hide under the hatch because some unknown monster came for him. His account of this and belief is that Annie woke up and came for them all. At this point, it's so heavily implied that there is a supernatural monster and perhaps the organism that they had been studying was linked to Annie so that she was somehow infected and came back from the grave to kill them. But it isn't, and I'll get to that later on. After all this, we get another filler dialogue scene until suddenly, oops, Clark is dead. He's found frozen outside, somehow, with Navarro just looking at him. Okay, what? How did he get there? Did Navarro just not decide to kill him with a gun and let him walk outside to freeze like the other group of men? More importantly, why is Danvers acting so furious at Navarro? She literally gave her permission to do whatever to Clark, and now she's angry when Navarro does so? None of it makes any sense, but it gets worse. We have one of those classic cliches where a character says something and then the other realizes and has a eureka moment based off a particular line of dialogue. This scene leads us to the realization that, oops, looks like one of the cleaning ladies with the missing finger was there at the research station and lo and behold, a bigger conspiracy is revealed where like the ending of the murder of the Orient Express, where it turns out that the people responsible for the deaths of the scientists were the cleaning ladies mafia. I don't even know where to begin with this revelation, but how ridiculous is that they all came out of their rooms like it was some sort of clown car house, and the whole feeling of them coming up to pat the elderly leader and stand behind them as some sort of intimidating presence like it was a big thought-provoking reveal just fell completely flat. I'm almost certain that the intention was to make them look in the same vein that the ending of Murder of the Orient Express was going for when it was revealed that there was a whole group of people responsible for the murder after all, but who were then let off because they each deserved their revenge. However, in that story, the case for each person was investigated thoroughly and presented well to the point where moral justification was a more interesting debate. In season 4 of True Detective, it's completely baffling that this group of ladies are justifying their actions and more importantly, are being completely let off by Danvers and Navarro. Yes, I get it. One of their own, both as natives to the land and as a woman, was brutally murdered by the group of scientists. But to not even bring this up to the police, to not even investigate further into who actually killed her, who made the first stab, it's beyond insane. On this latter note, I believe it's important to first identify who exactly killed Annie, and I don't understand how the cleaning ladies mafia could have ever realized that it was the whole group that did so. What kind of evidence is out there or available for them to make that realization? The dumbest part of all this is how they all break into the station like SEAL Team 6 and raid the entire place to kill all of the men. But the way the story is told is like almost meant to be sympathetic for the cleaning ladies mafia. As you watch Danvers and Navarro listen intently and empathetically as more and more cleaning ladies come out of their rooms. What the f***? is going on. These women are stone cold killers who met an overreaction that led to a violent murder with an even more extreme reaction that led to a brutal massacre. But because it's quote unquote justified for killing one of their own, we're meant to be okay with it? It feels like there's even an argument that violence against women is not okay but when you have it the other way around, all of a sudden it's acceptable to kill men who have turned on women? What? Two wrongs don't make a right. Even if it was from a standpoint of violence or destruction against nature, in that the scientists were somehow indirectly responsible for pollution in the town, I don't get how we should ever justify their murder because of that logic. If that was the case, then almost 
Every global corporation in the world can have its employees murdered and it would be fine because it's protecting and getting revenge for their crimes against nature. It's dumb, stupid and completely bonkers. Now, before I go, I have to also address some smaller aspects and missing links that were either brought up throughout the series but were never addressed later on or that just also don't make any sense at all and that genuinely irritate me. First up, the unnecessary links to season one and the symbolism of Carcosa. Throughout season four, there were these moments or hints towards something that had occurred in season one, which initially made me think, oh damn, this is going to be some sort of sequel or they were going to expand the lore of season one in an interesting way. But that like most aspects of season four, it ended up being nothing or just falling flat. For example, mentions to Russ Cole's father ended up going nowhere. The link of Tuttle United being possibly behind everything was never further investigated or even brought up again in the finale. And Time is a Flat Circle received the biggest spit in the face out of them all. She's been hiding in those caves forever. Oh. Before she was born, Jesus. after we all die, Time is a Flat Circle and we are Oh, stuck in it. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 It feels like they just had to mention that one line to please the fans. But the biggest thing that pissed me off was the whole spiral Carcosa imagery that was pretty much prevalent throughout the entire season. It was basically the one thing that was continuing between episodes and every time it was brought up, it felt like some shit was going to go down. But in the end, it was just nothing. All we got from the cleaning lady's mafia speech at the end was that it was somehow some sort of representation of where these men were heading towards after death. Some supernatural or spiritual world where Annie would meet them and that's it. I have no idea why on earth it was being brought up and the word Carcosa was not even uttered in the series. So why bring it up but not tie the connection to season one after all? It was just a tease over and over again. The biggest example of this was when they found Clark's trailer with all the Blair Witch shit that looked genuinely spooky and insane. I remember thinking, what the hell is going on here? And what crazy supernatural stuff is going to come later on? And then when they were looking for Otis, we found even more of it that looked terrifying. But all we got is some mysterious line about the night country. What? What is it? What is the night country? Oh, okay. We won't ever properly explain it then. We'll just give you a scary line to cut off to as a cliffhanger and then you can figure it out for yourself because it's there. It's subtle. Sure, but what was the point of the final Carcosa image in the freaking ice walls of that underground research lab? Who the hell did that? How do they do it? What kind of time did someone have to do that? Was it just the mark left by the cleaning ladies mafia? Was it their calling sign? Was it some sort of voodoo stuff that they did to scare people away or to haunt or control the bodies of others? That seems somewhat reasonable. But even if so, why did Clark have the tattoo of it in the first place? Where did he find out about it? Seems like he had that long before any of the cleaning ladies mafia went to kill him. If it was really all about sending evil people to a place of evil spirits, why wouldn't they even mention that in the finale? Is this a mark of those who commit evil or of those who protect evil? Sure, maybe it's subtle, but wouldn't it have been way more terrifying to mention this place of Carcosa as this dark underworld of spirits as opposed to just throwing it in there and oh, they're off to see Annie. What a waste of an iconic symbol and a hugely interesting piece of story lore. Next is the disappearance of the equipment engineer Oliver Tukak, who was brought up in one episode and then never mentioned again after he left and was never found. Doesn't it seem like a loose end to just leave him off the grid like that or for his disappearance to never be investigated? Did he know something about the cleaning ladies mafia and was scared away by them? If so, how? He looked fairly menacing when we first saw him. Then what about Otis and Clark or Oliver to Clark? Why were they related? Did Otis just help Annie find the cave and then leave her? Why was Otis so afraid of this night country? Did he know something he shouldn't have? Was it just his drug addiction all along? Also, how was there no CCTV except for seemingly only the place where Hank Pryor was seen following Danvers in his car and at the entrance of the mine? 
Did the research station not have any? Seems like they barely had any insulation at this place as well, let alone backup generators that actually worked. What was the deal with the pollution and the organism? For a group of world-renowned seasoned scientists, could they not have come up with a different solution to filter off the pollution specifically to the ice core samples located near the facility and not the town? Why did the whole of Ennis need to be subjected to severe levels of pollution so that ice core samples from a remote research facility away from the town be affected? More importantly, what exactly is it that this organism was promising? It seems like it was guaranteeing the promise of saving millions, if not billions of lives, but no one talked about its scientific nature or how it could have worked. I bring this up because one, it feels like lazy, weak writing, but importantly, it also feels like it reduces the work of the scientists to just practically dumb monkeys who have no clue what they're doing and who are doing work that is not even important. But in fact, it could actually be the biggest game changer humanity has ever seen. The whole final scene makes it feel like the biggest takeaway was the importance of not polluting and destroying nature so that we can learn to take care of our environment and that the deaths of the scientists involved were justified because their work wasn't important and that they were doing harm to the surroundings because of it. But this is just not true and it completely devalues everything they were doing. They genuinely believe the ends justify the means because in the cost of the environment and yes, some lives of the town in a population of what, 35 to 50 residents in a remote location at the end of the world, the rest of humankind was going to benefit. I mean, what other way is there to see it? Their deaths to me were a brutal tragedy. And it also reminds me of why on earth did the vet who examined them say they died before they were frozen? At the time, it was like a huge revelation to suggest that they were murdered before all of this happened. And I'm guessing the writers just threw that in there because it sounded dark and mysterious, but then realized, wait, how could we actually have people be murdered before they were frozen and then somehow hide that method of death in plain sight from everyone examining their bodies carefully? What was the importance of showing Danvers son Holden, who we basically don't know anything about? Why tease him and then expect a huge emotional reaction from the audience when she gets angry at Navarro for even bringing it up? What was the whole scene where Clark looks at Navarro like it's some sort of interstellar wormhole time connection loop? Is she some sort of ghost? Is she a spirit? Is she dead? Is that why we got the oranges falling at her feet scene from the ice to match with the oranges that fell from the fridge? Is that why there's that polar bear link? How come the rest of the mining corporation wasn't even mentioned in the finale? Why are the scientists getting all the blame? At least they were trying to do some sort of good. What was the deal with the scientist Lund before he died? Why didn't he just tell them what had happened? Oh, it was the cleaning ladies. There you go. End of show. Who left the tongue in the facility? Is it meant to be some creepy supernatural thing left over by Annie? What was even the point of it all? Time and time again, there was just so much dumb shit in this finale that never got resolved and that in reality reflected the whole season as a whole. A dumpster fire of garbage that had so much potential, but that wasted it all. What's even more crazy is that the series was one of the highest rated in terms of viewership, so clearly there was a huge demand for the show. And I worry now that despite the issues with the story and production, none of it will make a difference and that HBO will just simply commission more seasons without properly acknowledging the faults of the previous because they know they can just get away with being lazy and making more for profit. Just throw in a bit of mystery, lead people on until the very end and cash out your check. Like some of the scenes in season four, which seem to romanticize violence against men, corrupt justice and even suicide, I question the ethics of what the show will become in the future and of how it will come about. To this day, I'm still holding out that the original creator, Nick Pizzolatto, will return to show us more about Rust and Cole. But after watching season four, I truly won't be holding my breath. They begin in, I mean, there's um, in episode two, the character of Rose will say to us, and he's, the world is getting old and any is at the end of the world and it's where the fabric of all things is coming apart at the seams. So the, the, I have this idea that Ennis is a place where we can see through the fabric of the universe a little bit at moments and things can come through the fabric of reality. 
if you want to read the show as a supernatural show, you know, if you want to go down that path. And in that sense, you know, the dead can cross back and forth through that filter, if you want to believe that. If you don't, then some of the characters have a very large imagination, you know? And if you want to go the Danvers way, everything has a completely rational explanation.